Eric, I'm running out of clever introductions before the theme music from our house band Bend Sound, so let's launch right into the Paperback Warrior Podcast. <laughs> Hello once again. Thanks for listening to the Paperback Warrior podcast. We're a vintage fiction discussion and review program talking about paperbacks of the 20th century in the crime, action adventure, western, and espionage genres. The podcast is an offshoot of our blog, which you can find at paperbackwarrior.com, where we post book reviews and features discussing the best fiction ever. My name is Eric, and I'm here with my co-host Tom, who's going to tell us what's on today's show. Thanks, Eric. On today's program, we'll be doing a feature on crime fiction royalty, Charles Williams. I'll also be doing a segment on the movies and a contemp- of a contemporary writer and director named S. Craig Zoller and reviewing a bloodbath of a Western by him called A Congregation of Jackals. Eric, what's your review today? I'm going to be reviewing Gil Brewer's last career crime noir, 1967's Sin for Me. Before we get into the heart of the show, Eric, do you know what the most popular podcast in America is? And I'm going to give you a spoiler. It's not us. I do know. I'm, I'm guessing that is The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Podcast. Yeah, that is a podcast. He puts out his content on a yeah, podcast also? Oh, well, well, you're still wrong. The most popular podcast in America, and maybe the world, is the Joe Rogan Experience. Get out of town. Ever listen? I've listened to highlights of a show, and I'll, I used to be a diehard Ultimate Fighting Championship um, okay. yeah. fan, and he's a, you know, obviously a color commentator. I also watched him on Fear Factor. Right. But I've listened to a stand-up comedy, and he just seems like he's always high. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's part of the act. Yeah. I, it probably is, though. I dip into a show every now and then. It's a long podcast, and usually only as good as the guest who sits in on the show with him. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is because Joe Rogan has struck a deal with Spotify, a music and podcast platform that we're also on. The deal gives Spotify his entire back catalog and exclusivity on his new episode starting September 1 in exchange for a $100 million payday for Joe Rogan. Whew, that's crazy kind of money, dude. That's Howard Stern type of money. Totally. And for a podcast. I mean, so you're the boss here at Paperback Warrior. I'm just the unpaid hired help. How much would Spotify have to pay you for the exclusive rights to Paperback <laughs> Warrior Archive wow. and future episodes. What, what's your price, Eric? I mean, first off, I'd be flattered at the, at the very thought of it. But secondly, I can't imagine anyone giving me more than a wooden nickel for exclusive rights to this show. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and to say, I've been with you when you're negotiating a large <laughs> lot of used books. And you're a lovely man, Eric, one of my finest friends. But you were a dreadful negotiator. Uh, you've also seen me in action under the same circumstances. Yes, and you're a damn shark. You can make the sellers want to cry. And one and one time, you remember this, one time we were in New Smyrna Beach, south of here, and you nearly killed an elderly woman. Remember that? I don't remember that. We had to use a mirror at her mouth to see if she was still breathing. <laughs> well, she fell asleep while, yeah. <laughs> while we were negotiating. So right. She was an older woman. She wasn't giving in. All I'm saying she is that if Spotify or whoever wants to run our podcast exclusively, You, boss, should deputize me to negotiate the deal for you, or else you're going to wind up with no archives and a Toys R Us gift certificate. It's a deal, man. It's it's fine. Now, see, what they don't understand is that we have a coveted demographic here of highly literate older men who listen to our show. Uh, And the, the problem is that most of these guys can't remember where they laid down their reading glasses. I don't know if the music app Spotify is going to be the best fit for our audience, but if AOL Dial-Up wants to work out an exclusive deal, I think we have a, some real corporate synergies with them. So hit me up at paperbackwarrior at yahoo.com and let's work out a deal. I promise not to make you cry during the negotiations. Knowing this scheme is in your hands, I'm not going to be quitting my day job anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, what, what, what's, the, uh, what's the books you're holding there? Okay, so I got a couple books here. I've done some shopping, and uh, I picked these up as part of an eBay lot that I bought. And uh, tell the people what I'm handing to you. Reach over, reach, reach, reach. Oh. I've got "Murder with Love" by Vetchel Howard, and a "Murder on Her Mind" by the same author. Right. So the story on these. Uh, first thing to know is Vetchel Howard is the pseudonym of Howard Rigsby. 
He was a pulp magazine guy who transitioned to paperbacks originals in the 1950s. Uh, and he developed a following under his own name and the Vetchel Howard pseudonym. His output was a lot of westerns under his own name and the Vetchel Howard pseudonym as well, and a good bit of crime fiction. His most famous book was Sundown at Crazy Horse, a western from 1957 that was made into the movie The Last Sunset, starring Rock Hudson and Kirk Douglas. Fawcett Gold Medal did the movie tie-in edition, and so you can find the book under both titles. It's interesting to me that he used both names for both his westerns and his crime fiction. It seems that it would have made more business sense to have one name for one genre and the other name for the other genre, but uh, shockingly, he never came to me uh, for business advice. Anyway, the books you're holding right now are in his short-lived Private Eye series starring Johnny Church, operative for Gerard Secret Service. Uh, the book you got there, Murder with Love, came first in February 1950. And three months later, that second book, Murder on Her Mind, was released. Both look like pretty standard, hard-boiled, private eye murder mysteries. Uh, Mystery File website gave Murder with Love a B-minus review. But I'm kind of a cheap date, so I'll probably end up reading it anyway, and I'll let you know how it is. Um, anything from you before we go to the feature? As you and our listeners know, Tom, I've been on a British adventure kick all year. Yes. Uh, Six Gun Justice podcaster, host, and author Paul Bishop claims that author Douglas Riemann is fantastic. So I recently bought about eight or nine paperbacks by him for like, I don't know, 50 cents or something. They were in great condition. They're bagged and still crisp and shiny. These are World War II military fiction novels, most with a Royal Navy theme. According to Wikipedia, uh, Riemann authored 68 novels selling a whopping 34 million copies. He also wrote under the name Alexander Kent for a series of books set in the uh, Napoleonic Wars. And I'm anxious to try one of his books, and I'm hoping he isn't, like, really technical for my taste. Have you ever read one? No, never even heard of them. Never heard of them? Yeah. Well, I'm going to try them out. And if anybody has read these books and uh, has any comments for us, uh, send them them over to us so we can take a look at it. Is it a series, or do they all stand alone? Uh, they're all standalone. That's good. Yeah. And they're all, it's like British, like a Desmond Bagley type guy. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. Mm. Probably be a lot of fun. Are they thick? Uh, eh, probably like 200 pages. Oh, that's not bad. That's yeah. definitely doable. I just didn't want to see you bogged down in some 500 <laughs> page book with your lips getting tired <laughs> reading it. Well, my problem with British military books uh, in particular is sometimes they're really technical. Yeah. Uh, unless they're high adventure, they're just kind of technical. Exactly. Um, I've never read like. Have you ever read those Fox books? The, the Fox. No, uh, I heard though that like he gets into like pages of like the Nazis tying for yeah, his uh, nautical. <laughs> oh well. All right, right, so we're ready for a feature. Yeah, let's do the feature. All right, but I can't do it until you play the transition music because our, our listeners are resistant to change, and we need to appease them. Play the music. Again. All right. <laughs> So our feature today is on Charles Williams, and he's one of the most highly respected authors of uh, in classic crime fiction. And he, but he's not really a household name outside of geeks like us. He wrote 22 books, and he was one of the best-selling authors in the Fawcett Gold Medal stable. John D. McDonald was the best-selling gold medal author, and McDonald said that Williams was probably the best among his peers, but Williams just never got the break he needed. His heyday was between 1951 and 1960, when 17 of his books were published. Now, that's uh, of the 22 books he wrote, 17 came out during that period. He really has three kinds of books, crime thrillers, comedic coming-of-age stories, and contemporary nautical suspense books. Let's go through the timeline of his life a little bit to understand the guy better. So he was born in 1909 in a town called San Angelo, Texas. He was one of six kids, and both of his parents were born in Oklahoma Indian country in the late 1800s. His family relocated to Brownsville, Texas, and he dropped out of school in the 10th grade and later joined the Merchant Marines as a radio operator in 1929. It was there that he fell in love with the sea, which really influenced much of his writing. By 1939, he was working in Galveston, Texas, inspecting maritime radio systems. That year, he also got married and had a daughter. In 1942, he landed a good job in Washington State as an electronics inspector at the Puget Sound Navy Yard. In 1946, he moved to San Francisco again as a radio inspector. 
His knowledge and expertise in maritime radio systems was actually put to use in one of his last books. The book was called And the Deep Blue Sea from 1971, and it was nominated for an Edgar Award, and it had a lot of stuff about maritime radio systems in it. Anyway, going back, though, in 1950, Williams quits his job in San Francisco to become a full-time writer. Why did he do this in 1950, Eric? Yeah, we know where this is going. <laughs> Paperback originals. Exactly. This is like a recurring theme in the podcast. <laughs> Guys who are making a good living with a steady day job, quitting their jobs mysteriously in 1950 to go write paperbacks. It was such a phenomenon. I feel like every other episode we're telling the story of somebody who did that. Now, prior to that, he had written a novel on spec called Hill Girl, and he'd been shopping it around to various hardcover publishers, and he, nobody bit. Now, the advent of cheap 25-cent paperback originals novels exploded the market for potential buyers, and the book was published in 1951 by Fawcett Gold Medal. I read and reviewed Hill Girl at paperbackwarrior.com. It's the story of a 22-year-old named Bob Crane and his return home to an isolated mountain community after a multi-year absence uh, driven by his failed career as a college football lineman, and then he later became a losing prize fighter. So he comes back to his, old, his little town, and he reconnects with a girl named Angela, who was a gangly teen when he left. Shockingly, Eric, she is now a curvy sex pot. There's lots of family drama with Bob's big brother and Angela's hillbilly father. Although the paperback's titled Hill Girl, it's not really a lusty femme fatale crime novel that I was expecting. Instead, Williams wrote a short, very literary novel about the complicated relationship between these two brothers who came from a dysfunctional family and um, the hill girl who enters and basically complicates their life. This is a fantastic book, but it wasn't an adventure novel. It wasn't a crime novel. It wasn't a mystery. I can give the novel the highest endorsement without any reservations, but I want our listeners to know exactly what you're getting. And so that was uh, Charles Williams' first book, Hill Girl. Sometimes you're going to hear people refer to Williams' first three novels as the Girl Trilogy uh, because they were titled Hill Girl, Big City Girl, and River Girl. It's important to know, though, they're all independent, unconnected, standalone novels, not a series, not a trilogy. I read uh, and loved River Girl from 1951. The book was also later released as The Catfish Triangle. I think it's probably maybe the best place to start if you want to explore his writing. River Girl is a swamp noir paperback, and I want to do a full episode on swamp noir, <laughs> kind of explaining this weird subgenre. Uh, but it's basically about a crooked sheriff's deputy who meets this super hot woman who lives with her abusive husband deep in the swampland. Meanwhile, the deputy is under pressure from the local preacher to clean up the town, but all he can think about is this river girl and how much he wants her. So there's lust and humidity and pressure and that Deputy Jack is experiencing throughout this short novel. It's, it's really tense. The sexual chemistry between Jack and Doris, the lady, is, is hot, but it's never graphic because, you know, 1951 or whatever. And the culture of rationalized small-town corruption is pretty fascinating. The plot twists are ingenious and largely realistic, and the tension builds to this violent, action-packed climax. Throughout the book, Williams expertly walks the line between a noir crime novel and a forbidden romance story, and it works quite well, all the way up to this incredibly satisfying conclusion. Now, River Girl has been re-released by Starkhouse Books. You definitely want to check that one out. I loved it. Now, in 1953... Charles Williams publishes what critics believe might be his finest book. It was originally called Hell Hath No Fury, and it was retitled The Hot Spot. It was actually made into a movie starring Don Johnson. I read this one as well, and it was great. It was basically a solo bank heist book. A crooked used car salesman, he sees a vulnerability at the local bank and exploits, the, exploits it to plan and execute this audacious bank robbery. There's a hot femme fatale um, type who figures out that he was the robber and uh, you know basically a crime noir ensues it was great you should definitely check it out it's definitely his most hard-boiled crime novel to that point um, in 1954 he wrote a book called a touch of death i haven't read it but it's supposed to be really good it was reprinted by hard case crime so that's the one that most people own and have read today i hear good things i intend to get to it then we get to a period of his career where he wrote five novels that mostly take place on boats the five maritime books are Scorpion Reef, The Sailcloth Shroud, Aground, Dead Calm, 
and the deep blue sea. I don't have much love or interest for boat noir, but now you read Aground, uh, his 1960 book. What do you think of it? All right, yeah, I really liked it. Uh, Aground stars a World War II veteran and boat broker John Ingram, who gets tricked into helping steal a boat from port when he thought he was just doing an appraisal. Basically, John was conned. After talking with the boat's owner, a widow named Ray, the two team up to try and locate the missing yacht. Ray wants her property returned, and John, feeling partly responsible for the crime, agrees to assist. A ground features a likable male protagonist who finds himself in an extreme situation. Instead of a stereotypical sexy swamp nymph, Ray is an intelligent, brave addition to the story's twists and turns instead of a cunning swamp nymph. I can't reveal too many details, but John and Ray are forced to fight criminals in a very confined location. It's this edgy tightrope anxiety that makes a ground so entertaining. Thanks, Eric. You also read a couple of his early ones as well, right? Yeah, I did. I read A Girl Out Back from 1958. I thought it was a tongue-in-cheek look at the pulp crime genre, including a few hilarious jabs at Southern romance and plantation novels. It was a really good noir novel, definitely worth reading. I also really enjoyed his 1953 con man novel, Nothing in Her Way. The central con of the novel is essentially a fixed horse race, and I absolutely loved it. That's cool. In addition to the ones we discussed, I read and reviewed Man on the Run from 1958. I gotta say, I thought it was a weak effort. It was a very by-the-number story of a man on the run, accused of a crime he didn't commit. It was There was nothing special about it. You could totally safely skip that one with no problem. I also read a 1958 book by him called Talk of the Town that was later released as Stain of Suspicion. It was a pretty lackluster mystery novel and not also not worth your time. Now, Charles Williams is so good that even his bad novels are serviceable, but when you read his good stuff, it kind of spoils the lame ones. You can't just go back and read a, a crappy one by him after that. Now, the sequel to the one that you read and reviewed, A Ground, was called Dead Calm in 1963, and it was made into an Australian movie starring Nicole Kidman back in 1989. The movie was awesome, but I have not read the book. So that brings us up to 1972. Charles Williams' wife that year, he'd been married to her for 32 years, she dies from cancer in San Diego. In 1973, his last book called Man on a Leash is published. I haven't read it, but I'm told it reads as if he was shooting for a bestseller, but it just never happened. It was a very mainstream novel, and it just just never took off. So it's April 1975, Charles Williams is 65 years old, and he commits suicide. He'd been suffering from severe depression since the death of his wife a couple years earlier. He was living on a boat at the time. He sent a suicide letter to his literary agent, and then he went over the side of the boat and drowned. It was super sad, but he left behind this amazing body of work, all of which is still in print from a variety of reprint houses. So you want to keep your eyes on paperbackwarrior.com for more reviews of Charles Williams' books. I also want to give full credit here. Everything I know about Charles Williams I learned from an excellent book of essays called Hard-Boiled Noir and Gold Medals by Rick Olerman, Essays on Crime Fiction Writers from the 50s through the 90s, published by Starkhouse. It's just, it's just a wonderful reference book, and you should check that out. He's an author that both you and I enjoy quite a bit, and it's it's always a race to see which one of us will ta- tackle one of his books. Yeah. Okay, Eric, so uh, your turn. What are you going to review for us today? All right, I'm covering Sin for Me, a 1967 paperback by Gil Brewer. The book was originally published by Banner Books and has recently been packaged with Brewer's other Banner Books release, The Tease, also from 1967. This is a two-in-one reprint that's published by our good friend Starkhouse Press, and it was published last month. Uh, and In fact, I loved The Tease, and I was anxious to read Sin for Me. The thing you must realize is that The Tease and Sin for Me were the last two crime noir novels authored by Gil Brewer, He would go on to write television tie-in novels and house name stuff for a few more years, but for the most part, his literary career was over shortly after Sin for Me's publication. Brewer died in 1983 and suffered from depression and alcohol abuse. Sin for Me's main character is real estate agent Jess Sunderland. He's recovering from a bitter divorce from Germaine, a sexy, mountain-bred seductress. To rebound from the divorce, he goes to work for an old friend named Brownie at his real estate office in Denver. Like any Brewer novel... A woman shows up and sends Sutherland down the road of doom and despair. Her name is Carolyn Jones. After having Sunderland show her numerous houses throughout Denver, she finally confesses the true nature of her business. She was involved in a bank heist 
in Paperback Warriors' hometown of Jacksonville, Florida. Yay, Jacksonville. <laughs> Duval. For the heist, she had teamed up with Germain's new husband and some other cohorts. After the heist, Jones was abandoned and finds herself estranged from the money she helped steal. Now she wants Sunderland to assist her in locating the stolen money at Germain's residence. Like many of Brewer's well-designed protagonists, Sunderland agrees. Now, the author drags readers to the outlying, more rural areas of Denver as Sunderland and Jones try to locate the money. Along the way, Brewer introduces too many characters, and the plot takes a backseat to make room for all the other characters. There's a fraud investigator from Florida, there's Germain's family members, and various other criminals thrown into the mix. As a finale to Brewer's immensely successful crime noir stardom, Sin for me was really disappointing. It moves too briskly, introducing too many characters that are nothing more than cameo appearances in the story's elementary dynamics. There's a bank heist, the robbers turned on each other, Sunderland wants the money. It's a simple approach that could have even remained rudimentary, given Sunderland's desire to have Jermaine back in his arms. But the book's rushed pace and shallow characters left something to be desired. Like any Brewer novel, it's a fun reading experience, but one that could have been better. Packaged with the far superior The Tease, Starkhouse Press has balanced the great and the average together at an affordable price, and I think it's worth the money. Again, that was uh, Sin for Me by Gil Brewer. And that, that's packaged as a double with the T's, right? It's a new Starkhouse release. Correct. Got it. I'm going to break two rules here. I want to start by recommending three movies that you may enjoy if you like these type of books. And I also want to review a Western novel from 2010 written by the filmmaker behind these movies. Now, I know, I know, we're a vintage paperback podcast, but I really think these four pieces of contemporary media may have been created for you and I much more so than a modern audience. Now, the author and filmmaker in question is a guy by the name of S. Craig Zahler. It's Z-A-H-L-E-R. He was born in 1973, and he's from Miami. Like you and I, he grew up reading the type of stuff we discuss here on the show. I have it on good authority that he has a decent-sized collection of original pulp magazines. So all the inputs into this guy's brain are right on the money for us. So he wrote and directed in 2015 a Western starring Kurt Russell called Bone Tomahawk that I watched at home back in May. And the movie just really knocked me on my rear. It's about an Old West sheriff who pulls together a posse to rescue a woman from this town who's kidnapped by this reclusive, cave-dwelling, and terrifying tribe of Indians. It was awesome, but I have to tell you, it builds to a very, very cl- violent climax. You need to be ready for that. You may want to wait until your wife's out at book club uh, night to watch this one. It's, <laughs> it's called Bone Tomahawk. And if you like the Western, violent Westerns, you'll totally dig this movie. His second movie was a prison thriller called Brawl in Cell Block 99 from 2017 starring Vince Vaughn. It was a brutal prison movie, very violent. I liked it a lot, but it was probably my least favorite of his three movies. Now, his most recent movie was from 2018, and it was a modern police crime movie called Dragged Across Concrete, starring Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. It's about a couple crooked cops who planned the heist of a bank robbery crew while they're off the job on suspension for police brutality. It reminded me of the Fawcett Gold Medal violent heist novels that we read and review here on the show, mixed with the storytelling and visual style of Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. It was so good. The movie's called Dragged Across Concrete, and I loved it. So I watched all three of these movies on three consecutive nights, and then I learned that S. Craig Zoller is also a published author. The plot synopsis of his 2010 Western, A Congregation of Jackals, really appealed to me, so I got a special dispensation from Pope Eric to read it and review it at paperbackwarrior.com. In Congregation of Jackals, the year is 1888, and two brothers in Virginia receive telegrams inviting them to the wedding of an old friend in Montana that they haven't heard or seen from in decades. The invitation ominously references that all old acquaintances will be there. Now, Zahler kind of slow deals the revelations and reasons why the invitation sparks worries in these invitees, but the gist is that they were once part of a group of outlaws years ago that included the groom. Now, through flashbacks, we see we learn that things went nightmarishly wrong for this gang, and vengeance was sworn by this terrifying adversary. 
everyone in the gang goes their separate ways, hoping to put their past behind them, but then this vexing invitation to a wedding arrives. Now, the members of the gang need to go to Montana for this wedding because they're afraid that this enemy from their past might bring trouble to the no-shows and harm their families today. So Congregation of Jackals, very well written, very engaging paperback, and the pages turn very quickly thanks to this thin cinematic quality of the set pieces that the author creates. The novel is also periodically very violent and shocking, with scenes of brutality rivaling the darkest moments of the Edge series by George Gilman, but it was also clearly written with time and care. Admittedly, there's a lot of build-up to the final confrontation at the wedding, and some readers may find it slow at times, but I'm begging you to stick with it because this extended climax at the end is really something special. I would recommend seeing the movie Bone Tomahawk first, and if you like it, you're going to enjoy the heck out of A Congregation of Jackals. And again, the author is S. Craig Zoller. Well, that wraps up another jam-packed episode. Check out the paperbackwarrior.com blog every day, and follow us on Facebook to join the conversation. We'll see you here next Monday on the Paperback Warrior podcast. Bye, everybody.